This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Pray with me if you would, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When I was a little kid, one of my favorite things to do was ask my dad for stories from his childhood. There was a time where almost daily I would ask him, dad, can you tell me a story from when you were little? And no matter how many times he did, I didn't stop asking. This went on for years. If you're wondering where he came up with new stories each time, the answer is he didn't. We had like five stories that he would tell again and again. <laughs> there was one about pancakes, one about home improvement, and one about a soft boiled egg and some chewing gum of which I'm gonna spare you the details. But even though I knew these stories so well that I could probably tell them myself, I wanted to hear them over and over and over and over and over again. It just felt so crazy to me to imagine my dad as a little kid like me. Think about it. I knew him in one way as, well, my dad, mid thirties, academic, about yay tall. And for an eight-year-old, it was kind of crazy to realize for the first time that in another time and another place, the Netherlands in the 1960s, he had also been a curious kid like me. Imagining him when he was little gave me some context for my life. It helped me understand that if my dad had once been a kid, one day I would be an adult. And it helped me see how I fit into the big picture of our family's story. Now, we in the church have quite some practice with telling the same stories over and over. In fact, when I was asked to preach today, this is not very Christian of me, but I'm going to be honest, I was even a little disappointed to be preaching on the Epiphany story, because it's when we all know so well. We've got the wise men, and they see a star, and they come to Bethlehem, and they worship Jesus. Bada bing, bada boom, blessed be the tie that binds, let's go home, right? But there's a reason we like to tell these stories again and again. And I think it's especially true when we look at the stories that we tell for Advent and Christmas and Epiphany, which talk about how Jesus came into the world. On some level, I think it's the same thing that enchanted me about my dad's stories when I was little. It's just so unbelievable, so wild, that God was once like one of us, that the God who we know in one way, nudging and prompting us behind the scenes, moving the path beneath our feet in subtle ways we may only be able to see in hindsight, was once, in another time and another place, a human being like you and me. 
And I think this story in particular has something to say to us about who God is, how God moves, and how we're called to respond. So let's take a look. This story is going to introduce us to three sets of characters, and I want to get to know each of them a little bit. The first are the Magi. Now, our story begins after Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea. So even though we like to imagine the wise men showing up for the party on the same night as the shepherds and the angels, this story actually happens sometime after. We don't know exactly when, but we can kind of guess that it probably happened sometime in the first two years of Jesus's life because the wise men see the star after he's born. And later Herod tries to kill the baby Jesus by having all the children under two killed. So this story is happening somewhere in those two years, which means that if you've had your wise men hanging out at your nativity for all of December, you're doing it wrong. So after Jesus is born, we now meet this group of Magi from the East and the East here probably meant Persia or Babylon. You guys may be familiar with the story through the song, We Three Kings, but the Magi actually weren't kings themselves. They were more like counselors to the king, skilled in philosophy and medicine and natural science. And they observed the natural world like astronomers, but they also assigned a spiritual significance to the things they saw like astrologers. Now the Magi here are not the first or only Magi in the Bible. We actually have a great example of another Magus, Daniel in the book of Daniel, who interprets dreams and gives counsel to the king. So while at their worst, Magi were sometimes seen as nothing more than charlatans or magicians, they could also be men of God. They were first and foremost seekers. And that's what led our Magi to look at the stars and eventually make their way to Bethlehem. So these Magi are looking at the stars, they're reading the heavens and they see a sign, a star that somehow looks different from all the other stars, a star that has a special meaning and a significance to them which they know to identify as the star of David. So how do, they, how do they know, right? Well, it might have been that they were familiar with Jewish prophecy because for a while, the Israelites had lived in exile in Babylon. And actually Daniel, who I just mentioned was one of those Jews in exile. So the Israelites had brought their scriptures with them. And so if the Magi were from that area, that might be a reason they were familiar with this sign. But there's something else, something really interesting that I learned when I was researching this text and that's that actually a number of people across places and cultures at this time kind of shared this feeling that something was going to happen. Now, that might sound hard to believe, but I think we can actually probably relate, right? Think about the phrase unprecedented times. In many ways, the times in which we're living are unfortunately very much precedented. Plague and unrest and violence and loss are patterns of human history that we see going far back into time. But we use this phrase to express, I think, the feeling that something is happening. There's something going on right now that feels historic and exceptional. And it seems like the great thinkers of the biblical world at this time could relate to that feeling. I wanna share with you a passage from Barclay's commentary. Just be patient, hear me out. Quote, the strange thing is that just about the time Jesus was born, there was in the world a strange feeling of expectation of the coming of a king. Even the Roman historians knew about this. Not so very much later than this, Suetonius would write that there had spread all over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated at this time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Tacitus tells us of the same belief that there was a firm persuasion that at this time in the East, uh, sorry, that at this very time, the East was to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to acquire universal empire. And we even see Josephus, who was a noted historian at the time, write that Jews had the belief that, quote, about this time, one from their country should govern over the habitable earth, end quote. Now, this is kind of crazy, right? But hear me out. I think that here we're actually getting a picture of God and the way that God works in the world. The Magi were like astrologers. And when we think about astrology and the God of the Bible, those philosophies seem very far removed from each other. But even though these Magi were not Jewish, and came from a different culture and a different part of the world. And even though they had a really different way of looking at the world than we do, they were seekers. Seek and you will find. And here we see God using prophecies that they may have known and a sense of expectation that they may have had and the stars that we know they were reading to speak to them in their language and draw them to him. God was using the natural world and the circumstances of their lives to speak to them 
So if God is trying to catch your attention, he's not going to use something that you can't see or don't know how to interpret. You're not going to miss the boat, so to speak. And these magi don't miss the boat either. They see the star and it seems different and they follow it to Jerusalem where they take it to King Herod. Now, Herod is the second big character that the text introduces us to here. King Herod was a real historical figure, and we actually know a lot about him. He was called Herod the Great because he was super awesome from the perspective of Rome, who gave him his position ruling over Judea for the Roman Empire. He was known for huge building projects, infrastructure, theaters, and beautiful temples. So if you lived in ancient Judea under Herod's rule, the things around you got better all the time but life under his rule was not so easy. See, Herod was ruthless. He was known for killing his wives, his mothers-in-law, multiple sons, anybody who got in the way of his power or who threatened his throne. And even though his title as king of Judea was king of the Jews, that title wasn't earned. He didn't get it through the line of David or any kind of kingly line, but through politics and treachery. So how do you think he's gonna respond? when three well-respected men of inquiry, three men whose job description reads, interpreters of science, counselors for kings, show up and they say, hey, we got this magical and long-awaited sign about a baby and he's supposed to sit where you're sitting because he's king of the Jews. Have you heard anything? Well, you don't have to guess how Herod responded to, the, to this because the text tells us. Upon hearing this, Herod was disturbed. Another king, a rightful king, a king appointed by God, would be a major threat to him and his power. And as we see from all the exes through his family tree, anyone who gets between Herod and his power will not survive if he can help it. And this second half of the line made me laugh a little. Jerusalem is disturbed right along with him. When you are subject to the whims of an unstable and ruthless ruler, the things that set him off have a ripple effect, right? They make you uneasy. I'm sure we all have some experience with that. So Herod is disturbed and he does some investigating. He gathers together all his chief priests and he asks them where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And this is where we meet our third and final set of characters in today's story. The chief priests were educated men, well-trained in law and prophecy. In their day-to-day -day lives, they were what we might call privileged. They lived in the nice neighborhoods of Jerusalem. They had beautiful homes and comfortable lives. They had been able to dedicate their lives to the study of sacred texts. And when Herod asks them where the Messiah is supposed to be born, they use all their studies and they turn to the book of Micah to tell him that he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So Herod goes back to the Magi and he says, go look for the child. And when you find him, come back here and tell me where he is so I can worship him too. Now, this is a big deal for the Magi, right? Herod is king. This is like if you went to Russia and Vladimir Putin personally pulled you aside and asked you to do a side quest for him. Herod is ruthless and he's very, very powerful. You don't say no to someone like that. And so the wise men go on their way. The star emerges again, and this time it leads them to Bethlehem and directly to Mary and the young Jesus. When they see Jesus, they're overjoyed. They recognize that this little child toddling around, remember he wasn't a baby, but he was somewhere under two, is the one that the sign led them to. And in response to recognizing Jesus for who he is, they fall on their knees and they shower him with gifts. They're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they go home by a different route than the one that they took to Bethlehem. No, no, thank you, Mr. Putin. We are quite all right. Have a nice day. So we see here with Herod and the scribes and the Magi, three groups of people whose lives are interrupted by God in the same incident. And in their behavior, we see three different ways to respond. First is Herod. He wants to know where the baby is, not to worship, but to kill. And we know that because later on, he issues an edict for all children under the age of two to be murdered. He hears the news that the Messiah is here and that has direct consequences for his life. It's a threat to his power and his status and his sense of authority and control. Your kingdom come, after all, means my kingdom go. And Herod's response to that is a violent attempt to take whatever power he can. <clears throat> now, I know that we would like to pretend better when we're in polite company, but I'm sure we have all had moments like this. We all have little Herods inside of us sometimes who in the face of things that challenge our comfort zones and our status quo, clamp down 
on what we can control and maybe even manipulate for ourselves. Who in the face of God's might and glory do whatever we can to keep ourselves on the throne, even if it means living in our own tiny, wicked little kingdom. And then we have the chief priests, the educated, comfortable, high-minded guys who are familiar with the scriptures and they know how to recognize the truth of the things that they're reading and the, the prophecies that they've studied, studied all their lives. And yet, for all they know about God, they're not moved to respond in any way by the birth of the Messiah next door. These are the spiritually disengaged. Despite committing their lives to the study of these texts, when the very things they are studying are happening next door, they can't be bothered to go over to Bethlehem and see what God is doing for themselves. I looked it up, by the way. The distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem was 6.8 miles. For context, that is the distance between our little church and the target on Route 1. Now, we all have little Herods in us, but if I'm honest, I identify more with the chief priests. My life is good. I'm comfortable. I have a nice job and a wonderful family and the opportunity to travel here to be with them for the holidays. But sometimes your life looks so good that you forget. For all that you believe, when life gets easy, God becomes inconvenient and inessential. Literal miracles may be happening next door to you at the local Target, but you can't be bothered to get off the couch. And then finally, we have the Magi. The Magi are seekers. They don't come from this culture or even this neck of the woods. But God says, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. They see God's movement in the work that they do and the languages they're speaking every day, that of stars and patterns and symbols, and they recognize it for what it is, and they respond. They encounter the little child, Jesus, and in recognizing that he is the fulfillment of these prophecies, they're overcome with joy, and they fall on their knees in worship and submission. And they give gifts of gold <clears throat> and frankincense and myrrh. And when they're done adoring, the text tells us that they don't go back to Herod because they had a dream that warned them not to. But I'd like to imagine that there's another reason for this as well. They're changed by their encounter with Jesus and they can no longer align themselves with the same people and institutions that had power over them before. In the face of God's righteous authority, Herod looks a lot less authoritative and a lot more wicked. And I love this part, although I know it refers to the physical route that they took. The text tells us that they departed to their own country by another way. They take a different path home. After an encounter with Jesus, you're changed. You don't take the same route by which you came. But what does that mean for those of us whose encounters with Jesus were a long time ago? For those who may love God and long to see him moving, but find ourselves sometimes slipping into the role of Herod who wants to keep control or the scribes who can't be bothered to engage with God beyond their front door, how can we respond like the Magi? Well, since this is my first sermon, I'm gonna be really explicit about it. I want to challenge you and myself this week to respond to God in a new way. Sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zones or get out of the front door to remind ourselves of the power and majesty and amazing grace of our God. To remember that God is not just God as we know him now, but was once in another time and another place here in the flesh, and that he is still moving in ways that he has woven into our lives for us to notice. For me, this week, I'm going to be waking up a half hour early each day. I'll be honest, today it was 20 minutes and reading the Bible before I start my day. For you, maybe a better fit is a 15 minute walk in the afternoon, taking in the natural beauty of God's world and using it as an opportunity to pray be like the Magi, right? Take a walk. If those are already a part of your routines, I want to suggest dwelling in prayer on the requests from this week's joys and concerns and praying over each request every day for just a week. See how it changes you and the way that you relate to the people around you. Whatever it is, I want you to think about a practice that will challenge you and help you grow in your faith this week. Commit to that practice today before the end of this service I'll be here next Sunday, and I would love for you to ask me how my week-long commitment went and tell me what you did for yours, because that is what church is for, gathering and learning and growing together and responding as one body to God's amazing, powerful, 
inconvenient, overwhelming grace. In some ways, each week, we are just taking the next step of the journey that those Magi began over 2000 years ago. And let's keep that in mind today, reflecting on how God is calling us to move and responding faithfully as we turn in just a few minutes to the table and the bread and the cup. Amen. Thank you, Sarah.